So the third case is a history of a 69 year old male who comes into the hospital with several weeks of night sweats and weight loss. And so we get really excited when we find patients with B symptoms, right? B symptoms, night sweats, weight loss, fatigue, and we're concerned, does this patient have um, an underlying malignancy? And so for this patient, the pertinent finding was that there was presence of monocytosis with both an absolute monocytosis as well as a relative monocytosis as well. So for this patient, we take a look at the blood film. We note that the patient does have not so much of a left shift, so that means is there a shift toward immaturity? We see a band or two, but for the most part, the neutrophils are normal in appearance. Perhaps there are some toxic granulations, but otherwise there is no shift toward immaturity. We look at the lymphocytes and we look at the monocytes. Yes, there is an increased monocytosis. Well, so what are the points that I want to take from this case? Number one, Every time you hear fever and night sweats, people jump to the concern, to the need to rule out malignancy. And honestly, you should. This patient is in their 60s. They are the right age to think about it, but you don't want premature closure. You don't want to narrow down so much on a cancer possibility that you're missing other potential things that could explain the clinical presentation. Now, the second point is that this patient has a monocytosis. What is the differential for monocytosis? Well, monocytosis can be seen with chronic inflammation. So definitely you can see it with malignancy, with blood malignancy such as chronic myelomonocytic leukemia or CMML, but you also can see it with infection, you also can see it with autoimmune disease, and you can see it with malignancy, both hematologic malignancy and solid malignancy. And so you do want to make sure that you are expanding your differential and making sure that you're not missing anything. This patient also had evidence of hemolysis as demonstrated by an LDH that was elevated and also by reticulocyte counts that were elevated as well. So we checked a DAT and the DAT was negative. So this patient has a non-immune hemolysis. And there's a really broad differential for non-immune hemolysis. So that means the patient doesn't likely have autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And so when thinking about non-immune hemolysis, the differential diagnosis includes infection, it also includes hereditary hemoglobinopathies. It also includes enzyme abnormalities such as G6PD deficiency or pyruvate kinate deficiency. And it could also potentially be explained by toxins. And so for this patient, we do want to make sure that we're thinking about the possibility of malignancy. So now we've scheduled this patient for a bone marrow biopsy. And we want to also make sure that we're not missing other things that could potentially be happening in the setting of monocytosis. So we wanna make sure that we rule out infection. If not already done, the patient needs blood cultures, but we also do need to look for viral infections that potentially could be a cause of monocytosis as well. So we ask about family history, we ask about travel history, we ask about where the person lives and what kind of water they're exposed to. Sometimes that can make a difference in terms of what pathogens potentially patients are exposed to. So we did request an extensive workup and in looking closely, we uncovered that there was a protein gap. And so we also asked that they send a workup for a paraproteinemia. So we asked for a serum protein electrophoresis and urine protein electrophoresis, free light chains, and all the works in terms of looking for paraproteinemia or multiple myeloma. So those are the cases that I want to present to you. They're short and they're quick cases. We don't have the answers yet. So a lot of this stuff is happening in real time where we're asking for information before we come to a final diagnosis. And I think that the take home point from all these cases is that you really want to make sure that you expand your differential. You want to make sure that you are addressing potential drug-drug interactions. You want to make sure you don't take the diagnosis at face value, that you do your own investigation and make sure the patient has what they think the patient has. And then you also want to make sure that you actually go in person and talk to the patient we are in an age now where you don't have to talk to the patient to figure out what's going on with them, but it is important to talk to the patient because they are the missing piece of the puzzle. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.